Good morning, everyone. I'm Muriel Bowser. I'm the mayor of Washington, D.C. I'm joined today by members of my team to provide an update on the district's response to COVID-19. Um, today's update will be slightly longer. Um, we will provide updates on DC's vaccination program, including uh, who will be coming eligible in the coming weeks, as well as adjustments to our phase two posture and um, some preliminary um, discussion of our spring and summer posture. Uh, today, uh, numbers are reported here. You will remember um, that our seven day average is including a backlog that we reported last week. So it's slightly uh, higher because of that backlog. We think that will roll off um, this Wednesday. And uh, you see the remaining uh, numbers that we continue uh, to pay very close attention to. We have an additional number there in red. I think that's also reflective of the backlog, the mean test turnaround. Um, and uh, we remind DC residents to continue um, to answer the calls for contact tracers and um, comply with all of the, the requests from DC Health. I also want to report, and you can also find this information daily on coronavirus.dc.gov, uh, our vaccine distribution progress, including the number of first doses uh, administered, as well as the vaccination rates among DC uh, residents. So we continue um, to report that information. This week, uh, 20, uh, 20, this week, there will be 24,000 uh, doses delivered to the district. We will distribute those um, by uh, just over 13,000 going to vaccinate.dc.gov portal. Um, almost 8,000 to hospitals and healthcare centers in the district to distribute to their patients. And also 2,700 doses for special initiatives and partnerships that are targeting um, vulnerable populations. Uh, further, this past Saturday, we had a great event in Ward 7, uh, where many people uh, who had trouble getting a vaccinations were vaccinated at the Benning Started Recreation Center. So I want to thank all the partners who made that a huge success. Um, Johns Hopkins Sibley Memorial, the DC Housing Authority, DC Health, DC Homeland Security, and the Department of Parks and Recreation and Council Member Gray's office. Um, there will be additional clinics like this in Ward 5 and 8 targeting seniors who live in DC Housing Authority properties. Uh, further, we talked to you a little bit last week about um, the pre-registration site for um, our DC vaccination portal. And we have a little bit more information to share. Uh, DC Health sent out 14,833 invitations uh, for 13,630 appointments. Uh, 10,879 people booked their invitation appointments in the allotted time. Um, so on Monday the 15th today, DC Health sent out an additional 3,115 invitations to ensure uh, that all of the um, doses are used. I also want to uh, provide a quick snapshot of um, how the invitations uh, and the bookings of appointments broke down according to our priority groups. Uh, and you can um, refer to coronavirus.dc.gov to study those numbers uh, in particular. Uh, but you will see, for example, that 1,252 seniors and priority zip codes booked appointments and 2,264 seniors um, booked appointments from all DC um, zip codes. And to note, every senior who pre-registered by 11.59 p.m. on Thursday uh, was offered an appointment. 
Uh, you can also see the latest numbers in the registration portal as of 11:59 last night. Um, 114,815 people are in the portal, and this number uh, reflects um, the people who have booked their appointments are not included in this number. And I think we are also showing who, uh, how people are grouped. Uh, who are in the 114,815 that registered as of last night. Uh, I'll pick a different category this time. You can see that we're just over 2,800 or over 2,900 DC residents over the, over the age of 65. Uh, we're also, um, let me see if I can do that math really quickly, 47, for about 48,000 DC residents between the, eight, between the ages of 18 and 64 with qualifying medical conditions who are registered. Uh, and they, we have about um, 9,000 people who are in the eligible workforce and 68,700 people have registered who are not yet eligible. So that is what makes up the 114,000. And let me also remind you that you should pre-register by going online at vaccinate.dc.gov. You may call also using this number, 1-855-363-0333. And also remember uh, that moving forward, we will send out invitations to those who are pre-registered um, on Thursdays at 10 a.m., on Sundays at 10 a.m., and on Tuesdays by 10 a.m. If, uh, if there are appointments remaining for that week. So now I want to ask Dr. Nesbitt to talk about uh, updates to eligibility uh, criteria. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, many of you know that there is now a new directive to ensure that every person or individual in the general public uh, age 16 and over uh, is eligible for vaccination by May 1st. Uh, the district, given that we still have a limited vaccine supply to meet our demand, has not been able to create eligibility access uh, for some of our essential workers in a number of groups. Uh, in order to be able to have them have eligibility before we get to the general public, uh, we present the following timeline uh, for individuals to become eligible. Uh, these individuals, depending again on our vaccine supply, may begin to receive appointments uh, within the week of their eligibility. But again, that is contingent on our vaccine supply. We have um, remaining in phase 1B tier 3 and our phase 1C tier 1 uh, groups are that we will be onboarding individuals who work in our courts uh, and provide legal services to individuals, more frontline employees, in particular those who work in mass transit and food service, uh, which would be our restaurants and food trucks, et cetera. Uh, the employees of the U.S. Postal Service, uh, essential employees of local government agencies who have been reporting to in person and are required to report in person, essential employees of our public utilities, uh, including our waste management teams uh, at DPW, uh, essential employees in health, human, and, and social services organizations who have not already become eligible because they are not part of the outreach teams, but otherwise are providing services in person. And then we will also onboard uh, this uh, on 315, the week of this, this week, individuals working in commercial and residential property management uh, and environmental services. Uh, the week of March 29th, uh, so two weeks from now, uh, we will include more public transit, tra uh, transit workers uh, for those who don't work in the mass transit system, but are rather a uh, part of the system for higher vehicles and ride share. Uh, our individuals who uh, work in logistics and delivery and courier services, uh, as well as our media and mass communications essential employees. Uh, and finally, on the week of April 12th, we will create eligibility access for workers in phase 1C, 
uh, tier three. Uh, that includes our institution, institutions of higher education, so the many colleges and universities in the district, uh, those who work in construction, information technology, and as well as our employees and federal government agencies. Uh, so that will all help us to get to a point uh, beginning May 1st when Washington, D.C. will begin phase two, which are all D.C. residents who are 16 years and older and not in a prior phase. Uh, now, we understand that the supply of vaccine should be sufficient by the end of May uh, for every adult in the U.S. to be able to receive a dose of COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nesbitt. Um, uh, also, we'll, we'll note um, that we are in, um, I'll, I'll put into place the extension of the public health emergency uh, through May 20th. Um, the council has already uh, moved to um, permit that extension and we will do so um, by mayor's order. I uh, also want to note that we will plan for a next uh, check-in assessment um, based on DC Health's recommendations to me on what um, our metrics suggest about our reopening phases. So uh, keep that in mind. Uh, so now let's talk about uh, what is new and what I will plan to issue in a mayor's order. So I'll start with gatherings. And on, on the next slide, we've ordered it that on the left, you'll see what's new. Um, and you, on, the, on the right, you will see um, what we think uh, we will be able to say more about uh, after uh, the holiday and spring break. So what's new is out, the outdoor gathering limit will be increased to 50 people. Um, and we continue uh, to ask people to be mindful of their indoor gatherings and keep them limited. Um, and the limit is 10. Uh, so in April, we'll, um, we think that we'll, we'll continue to look at what our metrics su suggest about both indoor and outdoor limits. Um, next, recreational sports as of April, um, sorry, March 15th, that's today. Um, some high school sports can resume under the DC uh, SAA guidelines. Uh, field permits will be issued for spring seasons. Um, so that now some high school and middle school sports activity may resume applications for um, can open for spring sports, drills, and practices. Low to moderate contact sports may occur on a casual basis on our fields. Um, playgrounds remain open. Uh, there are also some a d number of DPR indoor activities that are um, will continue to resume with a reservation. And DPR fields, um, are limited to 250 persons in cohorts on the fields. Uh, and so in April, again, if there are changes that um, we need to continue to look at, we'll do it then, but we, we, we think that we've addressed what we need, where we need to be for the spring. Uh, for fitness and exercise, uh, indoor fitness classes may resume. Uh, this is new uh, with up to 10 people and um, the staff. Outdoor classes can follow the outdoor gathering limit of 50. So uh, remember, indoor classes can resume 25% um, capacity uh, in gyms um, or, or up to 250 people. So that is the status quo. And outdoor classes up to 50 people. Uh, again, we will check on our gathering limitations uh, at our next um, at our next check in. Professional sports uh, may operate uh, pursuant to their waiver with us, uh, and we will consider waivers with a plan. Uh, for fans uh, at those stadiums. Um, so professional sports teams may uh, apply or reapply to host fans at their stadium. 
Um, and again, we'll look at some point um, to not re requiring a waiver, but uh, to operate at this point, please submit a waiver. Uh, let me say a little bit more about um, where we are with restaurants and certainly uh, we are eager to all get back to normal with our restaurants and uh, we look forward uh, throughout the spring uh, to turning on activity. What we're able to turn on today is uh, alcohol sales uh, being able to go into midnight. Currently alcohol sales must end at 10 p.m. Uh, and now uh, we may go into midnight. We continue uh, to ask our our restaurants to um, maintain no standing at the bar, six feet table of parts, and uh, indoor capacity uh, limits of 25% or up to 250 people. Um, so uh, we will look forward to uh, reassessing uh, capacity limits in, in early April as well as entertainment within the restaurant. Live entertainment. Uh, let me say we know that our restaurant, hospitality, live entertainment, uh, all of the venues that I've just mentioned have been terribly impacted by COVID. Uh, and I know everybody is looking forward to turning on more activity. So we, uh, we paused our live entertainment pilot program that HCMA leads and we are turning that back on. Um, so if you have a live entertainment um, plan, um, please submit it to HCMA. Uh, and we will look forward to turning um, those around quickly. HCMA has, has some um, that we have uh, reviewed and will be uh, responding to. Uh, what's also new in this uh, category is movie theaters may open with 25 people or 25% capacity, whichever is less. I understand there'll be some guidance that also has some cohorting and space requirements for those movie theaters. Uh, and uh, looking forward, uh, we would look to um, all of the capacity limit limits and live entertainment waiver process. Museums, galleries, and exhibits. Uh, we have permitted uh, all of our museums to open for some time now. Um, now we add uh, the guided tours um, can resume in the district. I also want to mention uh, some other guidance that DC Health has issued um, recently. Grocery stores may begin to uh, operate their buffets, and I would tell everybody to look at the DC Health guidance related to that. Uh, DC Health will also issue uh, updated guidance on schools on be best public health practice, um, not regulatory requirements with an emphasis on the principles of universal masking uh, and six foot social distancing. So I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Nesbitt to go through a few of these items. Yes, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, this week we will release, as the mayor has mentioned, updated school guidance, and there are two documents. There's one that is for the school leadership, uh, LEA leadership globally, and then there's a school guidance for families of children in K through 12 education. Uh, so the combination of those two documents really helps to enforce and emphasize what we know to be the best public health practices uh, in the district. Uh, some things that are notable in the revised guidance is that the use of cohorts, mixing students and staff is highly recommended uh, to minimize exposures for a case, uh, if a case occurs in a teacher, staff, or student, um, such that the entire school building would not be impacted or all the entire students in the particular grade level uh, where co cohorting and mixing may occur. Uh, so LEAs and schools that choose to use cohorting, uh, choose not to use cohorting and allow for the mixing of students, we know this to be more common in the high school, uh, recognize that there is an increased risk of exposure. Uh, if an individual is positive, they'll tend to have more close contacts. Uh, we, also, we continue to recommend that meals be served in the classroom to prevent uh, the mixing of students in large spaces such as cafeterias, uh, recommending that we have a staggering drop-off pickup lines and times to, again, prevent people from aggregating and 
small spaces. And then also uh, recommending that we do our best job uh, not to share equipment, electronic devices, and school supplies in the building. And recognizing, again, similar to cohorts and mixing, the lack of cohorts and mixing, floating staff that move between room to room uh, should be limited such to reduce the number of individuals who could potentially be exposed. Uh, our school guidance uh, will also give more uh, detail to our schools uh, and LEAs who will be uh, allowing sports. Uh, we do recommend that the children continue to wear face masks and be physically distant uh, during their sporting activities, in particular where they are not doing active play and team competition on the, on the court or the field. Uh, and we are only allowing at this point low contact uh, games and that recommending that they should be held outdoors, which tends to be consistent with the majority of sports uh, that happened in the spring season in, in high schools. Um, moderate to high contact sports such as uh, basketball, football, soccer. Uh, we're, we're only we're recommending at this time that only organized drills and skill building activities uh, be permitted. And then lastly, uh, we get this a lot from our other students who are part of extracurricular activities that are not uh, sports, who want to know what's the status of their theater programs, choirs, band practices, uh, et cetera. These activities are no longer prohibited, uh, but we do recommend that they be canceled or modified to allow 10 feet of space uh, between participants because of the enhanced risk for transmission uh, with singing. Um, up, we now, um, as many of you know, the district has had in its public school system um, testing for uh, student test, uh, COVID-19 testing uh, available for students and teachers. Uh, that will continue, but we give a recommendation that schools should sample at least 10% of its asymptomatic students, asymptomatic students on a weekly basis. Uh, this guidance is provided because we know that um, the majority of children who are COVID-19 positive do not present with symptoms, and it helps us to identify more than symptomatic children. Uh, we have recommended that only on-site daily symptom screening needs to continue to occur uh, for employees, staff, and visitors, but not for students. Uh, parents should be encouraged to monitor the health status of their child at home uh, before sending them to school and not sending anyone to school who is sick. Um, and then we'll lastly recommend, remind all of our school partners that you are required uh, by DC regulation uh, to report to DC Health within 24 hours. Uh, and this is also included in our guidance document. Uh, so to, uh, dim to be able to give more clarity into what happens in our schools, uh, we will be providing a weekly schools dashboard. Uh, the dashboard will become more interactive in the next week or two. Um, but here we just highlight the total number of cases that we've seen related to schools since August uh, through the end of, fe of February. Uh, and there have been 796 reported cases, 35% of which have occurred in DCPS, 35% in private schools, and then approximately 30% occurring in our public charter school system. Uh, we do know that some of our school districts uh, were more um, uh, focused on bringing back elementary students uh, to school instead of the middle school and high school students, them being onboarded later, uh, in particular because of the um, how well virtual or remote learning happens or um, how successful it tends to be uh, depending on the grade level. Uh, and so when you look at our chart, you'll see that the majority of cases and all three systems are pretty much happening in our elementary school population, but that could be a reflection of what schools were brought back in person and when. And on the bottom right, uh, you'll notice that we have provided a summary of our outbreaks. Uh, there have been 26 outbreaks in our school setting. This means that there is an epidemiologically established link uh, between two or more cases. Uh, and while there have been 26, um, they are spread throughout the DC public school, public charter school, and private school system. Uh, and I will just emphasize that an outbreak is two or more cases. And so while a particular jurist, um, sector may have fewer outbreaks, they may have more students who are out, stu students, teacher, or other staff who are impacted with each outbreak. Uh, and then just lastly here, uh, we do show that um, again, emphasizing why it's important to 
uh, if you are able to implement uh, asymptomatic testing, sampling 10% of students each week. Uh, we do emphasize that parents must consent to this testing uh, for it to happen or for their child to be part of the, the sampling uh, process on a weekly basis. Uh, they must provide consent to the schools uh, that can be used as part of the school health services program. Uh, but the majority of our cases, around 74%, have been symptomatic. Uh, and again, this is not necessarily consistent with what we typically see uh, in child cases. And so we want to do a much better job of identifying those asymptomatic cases and reducing even further uh, the number of cases that are occurring as a relationship to schools. And um, there is some variation in terms of when we look at the role of the school, of the individuals who are a positive case in the school uh, with um, other staff being the highest number of cases reported at the DC public school system, students being the highest proportion of cases represented in the private uh, school system, and then there being a good mix of other staff and students in our public charter school uh, system. So I'll turn it back to you, Mayor. Thank you, Dr. Nesbitt. Um, so lastly, again, uh, there are several things that, uh, areas we didn't talk a lot about that um, we will talk more about next at the next check-in. So let me say uh, something about spring and summer programming updates. Um, March 29th, uh, 18 currently operating libraries will begin to offer more service, including access to public computers, printing and pickup, book pickup, and library card registration, and they continue to operate uh, at a 25% capacity. Uh, uh, Anacostia River boat tours uh, will resume, and some of the safety protocols are limits on participants, advanced uh, online registration, social distancing, uh, and hand sanitizer. Spring programming and permitting will begin um, for DPR. Uh, so um, Tuesday, March 26 at 12 noon, registration will open for DPR spring programs as well as the spring permit application window for low and no contact sports. So please go to DPR um, to, to sign up. For the summer, uh, DPR is planning 90 plus camps across all eight wards with social distancing safeguards in place. So please pay attention to these registration times. On Monday, March 22nd, that's next Monday at noon, registration opens for sports camps ages 3 to 12, aqua day camps ages 6 to 13, uh, and therapeutic recreation uh, age for ages 5 through 13. On Tuesday, March 23rd at noon, registration opens for little explorers ages 3 to 5. And on Wednesday, March the 24th, uh, registration opens for Discovery Camp, ages 6 to 10. Um, so please visit DPR, um, figure out which camp is going to be best for your family, and be prepared to sign up at dprsummercamp.com. And I think that's it for our update. We'll take your questions. Yes, Mark. Uh, Mayor Bowser, there's a lot here that you're... There is uh, a lot. I'm sorry to talk so long. That's okay. But I'm just wondering if you could just kind of sum up like the message that the public should take that you're loosening a lot of things, you're making a lot of changes, still not going as far, say, as Maryland uh, is going and other states are going. So if you could just kind of summarize what you want the public to take from this. Well, um, you summarized it pretty well, Mark, that we are loosening some of our phase two activities. This vi We have not crushed the virus in this city or this nation, and we have to be mindful of that. Um, we can't go back to normal because this virus is still circulating in our city. People are still getting sick and going to the hospital, um, and people are still dying. Um, and so we need to be focused on how we uh, are practicing um, good um, social distancing, mask wearing, and limiting our activities. 
and getting vaccinated. But there are, are more and more things that we can do uh, today, and there will be even more things that we can do uh, as spring, um, as spring uh, evolves, as we get later into the calendar, um, assuming that our numbers continue to go down. So that's my, uh, there's, there's hope, and there's reason to be optimistic. Uh, we have to continue to be vigilant, and we have to get vaccinated. And then could I follow up on the essential workers or the new, oh, sorry, the, the new phases that are, that you, the timeline that you're rolling out. It looks like now you will start, why is the decision now to start vaccinating federal workers like postal workers and whatnot that you'd kind of held off for? I know you had said somewhat waiting on the FEMA reply uh, for the federal government. And what does this mean as far as allocations for Maryland and Virginia residents uh, who are essential workers in the district? Um, I'm not sure I understand that. So I guess two parts, federal workers, can you tell? Can I think the federal workers were always in the D.C. Were. vaccination plan. They were, um, but you had held off. We, we were hopeful um, and we thought it would be more efficient um, since the administration announced that it would have federal sites um, to have those federal sites. Uh, especially uh, since, and Dr. Nesbitt will know better than I do how this schedule lines up with others. But we think that people can be, you know, best served at that federal site if they're serving that essential in-person federal function. But, you know, that boat has sailed. Um, so now we, we just think it's important for our employees and residents that people are vac vaccinated according to this priority plan. We hope um, that, and I think that we, can s that we will see with our experience with the portal, that people are going to their home jurisdiction even if they're an essential worker. And we think as more um, vaccine is available throughout that re the region, that will continue to happen. So I think it's a less acute a problem than it was in the beginning. So will you continue to limit the doses for out-of-state essential workers to 10%? I yes. believe that was what? Yes. Yeah. We're still, our priority groups remain. And then, um, that's good for me for now. I appreciate it. Okay. Thanks. All right. That was good. Yes, Julie. Um, can I start with a couple of questions about schools? Sure. Um, we, we've seen that there's some studies suggesting that three feet of distance in schools might be sufficient, not six feet. Is that something that you're looking at? Um, we make no comment on that at this stage. Um, I think that all of us probably heard over the weekend uh, that the CDC is looking at the data uh, and may make a recommendation as it relates to three feet and or six feet. Um, and for teachers who are hoping to come back in term four or who might be coming back in term four but are not yet vaccinated, what would your message to them be? Should they expect that they can get a vaccine before they return to school? Um, it, they should register and they will um, be assigned an, a, an appointment. Um, but we've said many times that uh, vaccination and school assignment are two separate issues. Do you expect that they will get vaccinated? I don't. I don't know. Uh, we we they are in uh, a, a priority group. Uh, they're prioritized in our group, and we're as as we have enough vaccine and the, the, those numbers look good. Um, you can see if we can go back to the number of of people who are vaccinated, we can show you how we're we're going through that list. Okay. Can I yeah. Ask one more sure. Um, you, you talked a moment ago about reasons for optimism on the numbers that right now we still have some metrics that don't look good that haven't really gone down since November when we were adding restrictions and now we're taking them away. What are those reasons for optimism? Why do you think that case counts will go down in the spring? Um, I think that more people are getting vaccinated um, and I don't know what the case counts are going to do, Julie. Uh, which is why you don't see us flinging open the doors um, because we have kind of plateaued. They're much lower, um, but they, they're, not, um, they're not doing a deep dive. Um, so that's why we all have to be, continue to be vigilant. This virus is not gone. Thank you. Yes, Sam. Uh, yes, Mayor. Uh, I've seen pictures uh, from, I guess, yesterday of a... Uh, 
group called Mochella. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but uh, I'd never heard of it before, but it's apparently a, like a go-go outfit. And um, they, uh, I think, were at the Reeve Center yesterday, and then I heard maybe they were at Black Lives Matter Plaza, but the point is, when I looked at it, I thought I was looking at something from another year. Uh, then I noticed a few people had masks on. Well, we're talking about thousands of people uh, dancing in the streets, whatever. What do you have to say about that? And is there any plan to restrict it? Um, I don't know what the MPD response was, uh, Sam, but a large gathering, a special event, is an unpermitted event uh, is not permitted. Um, now, I, d I don't know the nature of that event, and I will check into it. It will go-go. It's music. It's an entertainment event. And obviously, um, well, what I'm told is that they know about it through social media, so people gather in one spot, but there are Yeah, like I said, let me, let me look into that a little bit more. One other thing I'm curious about is um, the number of vaccines. Do they go up and down? I, I th it seems like there were more last week. I don't know. Dr. Nesbitt. Sure. Uh, so there's a couple of things to note. Um, we talk about the number of doses delivering this week to the district, uh, and then that converts to appointments that are made. Uh, so we, you will recall that at one point we had an infusion of 6,000 doses of Johnson & Johnson vaccine uh, that came into the district at one time, and that is not continuing on a week-to-week -week basis. We may not have access to order that vaccine again until maybe next week uh, at the earliest. The other thing that we have is that we have, I'll talk about it in terms of visibility, what we know. We know how many doses the federal government is giving to the District of Columbia, the government of the District of Columbia to manage. And so that number is a huge, denom is a huge denominator. We believe it's the highest number of doses that come into the city. Then the federal government has established direct programs. Uh, where federally qualified health centers can receive vaccine directly, the federal retail partner, ph pharmacy partnership, they can receive doses and order them uh, directly. And then there's a set of federal entities that include the Department of Defense, um, the VA, the Bureau of Prisons, the Indian Health Service, they get access to their own vaccines as well. Now, the ones, the federally qualified health centers, the retail pharmacy partnership, and most definitely the federal entities, we do not have the same level of awareness of the number of doses they are receiving that comes into the district, presumably to vaccinate district residents and essential workers. Our federally qualified health centers and our retail pharmacy partners have done a really good job of notifying us about the number that they receive. Um, but they're not required to tell us how many doses they are received. They're only required to report to us when they vaccinate someone in the district. And is that, are those numbers in the 24,000? The, the, in the 24,000, we have included the federal retail pharmacy partnerships and federally qualified health center doses that we know of. None of the Department of Defense or VA doses are reflected in our number. There are some federal websites that reflect their number. Uh, and their activity, but we don't have d definitive information on that to us, sent to I, us directly. I guess I was just curious because it seemed there were more doses last week, but you're saying that a lot of that could have had to do with Johnson & Johnson. That's correct. And okay. sometimes we're permitted to, we order on average about 98% or more of the vaccine that's available to us. Uh, some weeks we may hold back on ordering something if we have a big initiative that is planned. Uh, so that happened last week as well. Characterize, if you would, the, uh, the, the response to the change, because I see the numbers you gave us today said basically uh, 15,000 invitations were sent out uh, after, after last week's registration, but only 10,000 were booked. What, what's that all about? So, uh, Sam, we believe that there's always going to be a gap between the percentage of appointments that are sent out for people to actually, see, or invitations that are sent out uh, for people to schedule an appointment and those who book an appointment. If you go back to the other slide, you'll, you'll recall, again, that the district receives an allocation of vaccine. We put that out in the portal. Then we give some to our healthcare system. So all of our hospitals and health systems, our federally qualified health centers, they receive doses as well. 
And then we have special initiatives and partnerships, the faith and vaccines. The mayor highlighted again some of the work that we're doing with the housing authority. People get vaccinated through those means. So it is not inconceivable that someone registers with the district and gets vaccinated somewhere else in one of those other two categories. Uh, and so we believe we'll continue to see uh, a, that gap there uh, because people are sort of putting themselves on whatever list uh, they can get on in, in terms of their, the current demand for the vaccine. Yes, Amanda. Thank you. Um, um, will the workers who are becoming eligible in the coming weeks, are they only ever going to be able to book an appointment through the portal and call center or do you anticipate because I know for teachers there was like a special initiative and they like signed up directly through one medical or something like that so I wonder if workers are ever go is that if you're ever going to set something up like that you know you have special initiatives again for public housing and yeah um, it's possible but it's not our current plan right okay. so we don't currently have a pod that's what we refer to them as a pod uh, set up for metro workers, for example. Uh, they should register either in their home jurisdiction. All of the jurisdictions have pretty much activated, in our region, have activated mass transit workers as an eligible group. Uh, and so they should register for vaccine in their home jurisdiction, and they are also eligible here in the district. Uh, but we do not currently have plans for pods, but it is possible that they may occur. Understood. And then another question about the snapshot of invitations. Um, it looks like with 3,000, they have 3,393 seniors registered. Are you satisfied with, with that number? I think last, I think you dedicated 5,400 or, and wanted to, to, you wanted more seniors registered. I just wondered what you think of the snapshot. So we sent, as, as you're noticing on the snapshot, and as the mayor mentioned in her comments, every senior who was registered received an invitation for a vaccine. Uh, what we expect is that as the process matures, more people will assist seniors in getting registered and helping them to get an appointment uh, so that we may be able to allocate 20% uh, or 40% total of the vaccines we have to the 65 and up population. The other piece to that is that the priority groups that onboarded earlier over time are gonna diminish their need because more of them have been vaccinated. So we're at about 57% of seniors. We were projected to get to 70% of them, but their demand started to slow down uh, citywide. As you can note, there's no difference between the response, no real difference between the response rate for seniors in priority zip codes and seniors across the city. Uh, and so we expect that they may plateau uh, around some point and maybe not get to 70% of that population signing up for vaccination. Uh, I will mention again, however, is that we're not getting all of the data we would like to get from the VA, and there may be some seniors who were vaccinated through that system that we still need data for. Right, gotcha. Thank you. Thank you. James? Uh, Dr. Nesbitt, um, first question has to deal with the um, staff working in courts and individuals providing legal services. Lots of lawyers here in this town. Uh, does that include uh, CJA attorneys? And these are attorneys that go to the courthouse to pick up criminal cases uh, in, in that process. Does that include them, CJA attorneys, as well as attorneys who work at, for large law firms, et cetera? That's correct. And um, I'll emphasize again here that when we create a tiered phase, uh, this is designed for the essential workers, uh, in, in particular those who have been working in person and their legal staff. So when you, as you described it, a big law office where there's paralegals and legal secretaries and a host of individuals, some of whom may be working remotely right now, we would not expect that they would go into the system and register. Those individuals, the lawyers, attorneys, paralegals, court reporters, all of those folks who are actively engaged in the court system, uh, providing in-person services, um, lawyers who are going to healthcare facilities, helping people with their estate planning, uh, they would be eligible. Okay. My second question has to do with the media itself. Uh, in does this apply to members of the media who work in the district but may not live in the district? Uh, yes. So again, our essential worker has focused on those who live in the district and work in the district. But this would, again, the same holds true. We have many people who describe themselves as part of media and mass communication and they blog from home. Uh, so this is not designed to bring all of them uh, into the system. This is more focused on the members of our media and mass communications team who are actively out 
um, and engaging and working in person. Yes. Um, Beatrice Peterson, ABC News. Hi. Hi. Um, last week you were asked about the Capitol fencing and you said you were hoping to go and visit it. Um, since then, they're starting to take down more of the fencing at the Capitol. Your thoughts on that and have you been able to go to the Capitol? Well, let me be clear. I have visited the Capitol um, be before last week and I, I should have made that more clear. I walked half of the perimeter when it was at its most robust. Uh, and I have been inside the Capitol since the insurrection. Um, I didn't do the walk that I hoped to do last week. Um, and I think that was your question. More than that, I've seen an early report from the sergeants at arms. I haven't reviewed it in detail, um, but they're moving in the right direction. Thank you. All right, okay, Mark. Uh, yes, uh, two questions, one off and one on topic. Uh, on topic, uh, the nationals yes if you could speak specifically to opening day up until now fans have had at least some hope that a decision might be changed or might be reassessed in time for opening day yes. which is april 1st according to the slide it appears you won't look at waivers again until i believe april 5th is the date no well, so well you, just you misunderstand or i or i misspoke um we you can do uh, all of our professional sports teams can submit a waiver application for fans now um and the washington nationals we expect and dc united will do that uh, and we expect with their plans um, that we have been talking to them both um, will be approved as early as today. For both the, for the Nationals and for? U DC United, yes. Okay, thank you. Do you know what capacity that you're going to allow Nats Park at? Um, I think where we are is 5,000, um, but in I think a couple of thousand at DC United. And then on off topic, uh, could you just update us on Black Lives Matter Plaza? There was an opening there today. Is that permanent? Is it going to expand anymore? What's actually going to happen there? Uh, there is a um, the traffic is moving, I think, beginning today. And we, we have also had other traffic movements on Black Lives Matter Plaza before that. Uh, we continue to work with DDOT and the, the businesses around it uh, for a more permanent um, a, a more permanent fix to traffic. And we expect to be able to talk about that soon. All right, thank you everybody.